Welcome to this six part lecture series on the ethical implications of emerging mixed reality. My name is Marcus Carter. I'm a senior lecturer at the University of Sydney, and I think VR is fantastic, but we need to be cognizant of some of the ethical implications that these technologies are gonna have before we allow them to become um, an embedded part of our lives and changing some of the ways that they've impacted our lives becomes really difficult, as we've seen with something like social media. In this lecture, I'm gonna be discussing the issues that have emerged around virtual reality and augmented reality technologies and their use in public space. In his various works on augmented reality, Mark Pesci writes that the, by virtue of the way that they operate, augmented reality systems must simultaneously act as very sophisticated surveillance systems. The purpose of this video is to discuss how the ways that these systems interface with existing spaces and their established norms and ethics is ethically fraught. If we look at an example like Facebook's proposed Live Maps application, shown here, we can see that the level of data collection about our environment that is needed for something like this to function uh, is, is insane. What are the consequences for the misuse of this data in, say, the delivery of targeted political adverts or algorithmic discrimination? Katrin Wolf and her colleagues argue that we should move away from thinking about augmented reality as just a visual medium in discussions of privacy. It's not just about what we're seeing. They should suggest instead that we should be focusing on the other types of information that are being captured by augmented reality devices, such as voice and sound that may be present in an environment or the characteristics and objects in an environment that an augmented reality device recognize. These are aspects of augmented reality's data collection that are currently overlooked in legislation and AR privacy discussions. Irrespective of how you feel about your own data, what about the inability to opt out of these systems if everybody else is wearing a pair of augmented reality glasses? Needless to say, there are an enormous amount of legal issues around the data that could be collected by these devices, the majority of which remain unresolved. This will limit the uptake of augmented reality. A very fam famous case is from 2012, where an augmented reality professor was assaulted in a Paris McDonald's by people who objected to him wearing his Google smart glasses that have the potential to be recording everything that he was seeing in store. Another emerging issue when it comes to mixed reality and the spaces um, and public spaces is what rights you have against augmented reality being overlaid on your own reality. Mark Augmented Reality is a graffiti mobile augmented reality application which allows the creation and enforcement and placement of persistent digital images in real world environments. These can be used for fun, but hidden features these can be used for fun, like hiding a hidden feature in a real world environment. But what if that blank canvas gets painted with the hate speech? What if, perchance, the homes of undesirables are singled out with graffiti that only other bad actors can see? What happens when every gathering place for an oppressed community gets invisibly tagged by their oppressors? In short, what happens when bad actors use Facebook's augmented reality to amplify their own capacity? to act badly. Mark Squarek, in contrast, uses augmented reality for political activism. Mark has created a virtually rendered elimination of the borders between Israel and Palestine at the Gaza Strip. Others have created, deployed augmented reality for subversive critical commentary. For example, artists overlaid artworks at the New York Museum of Modern Art with images or text making these artworks unrecognisable. The goal of which was to challenge the authority of high art as something produced by individuals with certain social and class interests. While these examples do not lessen the issues associated with augmented reality as an invasive technology, it does show that this can at least be done for expressive or purposeful ends. Now the sudden popularity of Pokemon Go was something that highlighted many of these issues. People suddenly found their homes transformed into virtual playgrounds and many others complained to the police in response to the rapid and unexplained increase in foot traffic in parks and other public spaces. The result was conflict between physical property laws and the developer Niantic's ability to repurpose existing public and private spaces for augmented reality play 
of which they made a lot of money. These examples are taken from the Pokemonbidtumblr.com, which show the ways that Pokemon, the Pokemon world, which was playable anywhere, with its interactive Pokemon gyms and Pokestops at things like graves, 9-11 memorials, conflicted with the values and norms that are already present in the physical world. It's not appropriate to play at one of these sites, but augmented reality didn't recognize, the technology wasn't recognizing those existing social norms. As currently designed, augmented reality often fails to acknowledge these norms, leading to conflict. The Auschwitz Memorial Museum actually had to tweet at Niantic to disable Pokemon Go as something playable, something that was playable on their um, memorial grounds. And in 2019, Niantic settled a lawsuit brought by US homeowners in response to this issue. What rights do technology companies have to dictate digital layers over existing physical spaces that already have established legal, cultural, and social norms? As part of the settlement, Niantic now promises to resolve complaints within 15 days, remove any stock that's located within 40 meters of that property, and maintain a database that will prevent new gym or poker stops from popping up nearby. Beyond private homes, park authorities will also be able to request that gyms and poker stops only appear during open hours, while the people were breaking into places to play. Niantic also reportedly paid $1,000 to each person named in the class action lawsuit. Now, other issues around the politics of space in the context of augmented reality have also emerged with Pokemon Go. Writing in Overland, Brendan Keo makes the comparison between the experience of playing Pokemon Go and the 19th century figure of the Flaneur, a figure from the work of Baudelaire, a typically socio-economically privileged white man who experiences urban space not out of the usual purposeful motivation of movement, you're going to work, but through a kind of urban drifting or wandering. The comparison is between the Flaneur and the Pokemon Go player is, at the face of it, an easy one. Many found themselves wandering the streets with the hope of stumbling upon a rare and powerful Pokemon, moving around the city in ways that differed from their usual motives to move around. But Keo notes that both the Flaneur and the Pokemon Go player and their engagements with the city are not free of politics. The politics of class, gender, and race characterize these practices of moving throughout the city much as they characterize the experience of playing Pokemon Go. As he puts it, a 19th century woman would have a hard time being a flaneur, as would a non-white person in city spaces, people who are disproportionately targeted and profiled as potential threats by police. As Kira puts it, the non-white person who dares stroll around the city without clear purpose is seen as suspicious, as a loiterer, and might attract the attention of law enforcement, attention that continues to be potentially deadly affair in many Western countries. Data has also been a key concern of Pokemon Go. The data that we give up to the application about how we move through physical space while playing is valuable, and it's been used to inform things like Google Maps walking directions. More recently, Pokemon Go has expanded its data collection into 3D scans, asking players to scan monuments that feature in the game to enable shared augmented reality experiences in the future. Now, this might sound like a lot of fun, but all of this is part of a data gold rush in mixed reality, where whoever can create the most data about the world to create as accurate a digital map as possible, the mirror world, will be able to provide the infrastructure for the next generation of augmented reality experiences. I, for one, welcome our new Pika overlords. So thanks for watching this video in this series. Don't forget to take a look at the full ethical implications of emerging mixed reality technologies report, link in the video description below, which has further details on all of these aspects and references to many additional resources on these topics. Thanks very much. I'll see you in the next video.